it's kind of a tough thing to say don't water at the most important time of the year. Mm -hmm. So the best strategy there is just to make sure that your soil profile is topped up. Hello, I'm Ken Coles, General Manager of Farming Smarter, and today our guest is Dr. Randy Kutcher from the University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon. And um, we're pleased to have you as a guest, and this is part of a series in partnership with the Lethbridge College. Uh, a grant that uh, came from the Alberta government, the CAP program, allows us to put on these podcasts, and we are actually really excited to have the opportunity to talk with you and many guests about applied research in southern Alberta. So welcome, Randy. Thanks very much, Ken. And, and Randy, so you are a professor from the University of Saskatchewan, is that correct? Right. And why don't you tell us a little bit about your, your history as far as research is concerned in, in, in agriculture? Well, I guess I've been at this over 30 years already. I can't believe it's been that long. So Couldn't I, tell uh, by the gray hair there. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, it runs in my family. It yeah, starts me a bit too. early. So. <laughs> um, I started working on Black Lake in the, one of the late 80s, I guess, mid to late 80s. Mm -hmm. I went back to, after my undergrad degree, I'd worked a number of years for uh, Northern Sales. It was a small contracting company. And that's a canola disease, right? Uh, yeah, and then I went back to ma do my master's with Roger Rimmer. So I don't know if you remember Roger Rimmer, but he uh, did mainly canola uh, research. And so Black Leg was just becoming a pretty big issue in the mid-80s in uh, eastern Saskatchewan into Manitoba. Okay. And so that was uh, really interesting. I really liked it. I didn't think I would go on to study again, but I kind of got hooked. And nice. uh, I moved to Saskatoon and did a PhD up there on barley. So working uh, diseases again and kind of genetics, breeding to some degree, trying to manage common root rot and spot blotch of barley. Okay. Uh, did a little stint in biocontrol, trying to kill weeds with fungi, which is a tall order. Yeah. Uh, to try and, you know, uh, compete with chemicals that are pretty effective and pretty economic. Uh, and then I made a choice to do the genetic route or go up to Melford with Agriculture Canada. So Melford, Saskatchewan, uh, where it's more of an applied plant pathology program, I guess you could call it agronomy to some degree, but I focus mainly on diseases of initially pulses, but also a lot of canola work. And I spent 15 years up there, which was great. I really liked the area, the people, and, and we, things we did up there. Uh, but the university had a job opening in 2011, okay. and I was quite interested to, uh, to pursue that. So I came back to the University of Saskatchewan, and then the focus shifted from canola to cereal. So my mandate is really all the cereal crops and flax. So pathology. So Excellent. striped rust was one of my favorites when I started, but okay. uh, now I'm getting into uh, fusarium because it's been such a difficult issue, especially with the wet years we've had from 2010 to, well, 16 basically, although 15 was kind of dry for us. That, uh, you know, growers have had a lot of problems, even in southern Saskatchewan, I think even down here now that, you know, it's a really difficult disease, especially in Durham. So mm -hmm. it's been the focus of my research between striped rust and fusarium in the cereals. Oh, excellent. And uh, yeah, fusarium head blight in southern Alberta has been a bit of a, an issue, especially because of the irrigation that we have. So mm -hmm. um, we, we like to blame you in Saskatchewan for allowing the fusarium to enter our province, but um, then you would just blame Manitoba, right? Well, yeah. it's kind of a pecking order. I mean, yeah. it probably, you know, the Minnesotans and the North Dakotans, they've yeah. had to deal with this for even longer. But certainly about 93, I think, was the really the worst uh, fusarium head blight year in southern, you know, Red River Valley. Mm -hmm. And then slowly over the years, it's just moved into eastern Saskatchewan. And it's pretty much across the province. I think the northwest is probably not nearly as bad yet, but it's, I don't think they can probably say they're fusarium free, but it's right. the conditions that occur, right? So right. if you have dry years, you know, if we have a dry flowering period, um, then it's not as much of an issue, obviously, but when you have conditions, especially under irrigation, if you're irrigating during anthesis, you've got the pathogen there and the residue mm -hmm. and uh, the spores get airborne and they get into those flowers and then you have an issue. Yeah. I think that's one thing a lot of people don't realize that, you know, a plant pathologist. What is what is that exactly? And and you know that there's so many different complex diseases within uh, growing crops that you know you, you hear about pathologists in medicine and such like that. But yeah, I mean it's basically, it's basically means the disease. same thing, right? Yeah. yeah, study of disease. So whether it yeah. be in humans, animals, 
uh, any organism, other things that mm -hmm. parasitize. Uh, usually for us, it's plants. It's usually fungi, but mm -hmm. we have some viral diseases. I think you pointed out you might have a bit of uh, viral issue in some of your wheat this year. Yep. But uh, generally, fungi are by and large the main causal organisms of most of the mm -hmm. diseases we face yeah. in the prairies here. So they're all very interesting, and we'll talk more about Fusarium for sure. Um, I'm just wondering maybe if you couldn't describe a little bit some of the strategies that you've been studying and, and that farmers are employing now to help manage these diseases. Yeah, I mean, the big, big strategies for many diseases, it does depend somewhat on whether the disease or the pathogen that causes the disease survives over the winter on residue. Mm -hmm. So residue-borne diseases, one of the most effective ways of managing those diseases is crop rotation, a diverse crop rotation, growing more than wheat canola, right? If you can yep. put at least a third crop, hopefully a fourth crop, and figure out which ones are economic to grow, yep. you can reduce a lot of the inputs like fungicides uh, usually. But yep. when you have conducive years when it's really wet and humid and warm, uh, sometimes that's just not enough. So, you know, supplement that. Choose the best variety you can, mm -hmm. uh, which unfortunately, Fusarium, we've had a tough time developing uh, very strong resistance, but in the spring wheats, we're getting there. Um, hard red spring, there's some pretty good moderately resistant varieties to Fusarium head blight. Mm -hmm. Durham, not so much. You know, right. we've got a long way to go in Durham yet. So basically, crop rotation, diverse crop rotation, genetic resistance, and then if the conditions are conducive during anthesis, look at applying a fungicide. That those are the three, you know, I would say key strategies for dealing with many diseases. Yep. Then there's lots of subtle things you can do. Look at row spacing, seeding rate, fertility, how does that impact it? When you put your water on down here, mm -hmm. being from Saskatchewan, we don't have as nearly as much irrigation as mm -hmm. you folks do. But, uh, you know, you have some control of that here when you put your water on to try and yep. avoid peak uh, disease infection periods. Yeah. So, so in our case, and you mentioned earlier when you're talking about Fusarium head blight, that wheat flowers... And, and the flowering period is, is when it's susceptible, right? Right. So then you yeah. avoid watering during that period. Yeah, you try and keep your relative humidity and your, you know, your leaf surface wetness or your spike yeah. surface wetness as low as possible during that period, right? Yeah. So I'm not an irrigation sure. person, so you tell me when you have to put your water on. But I guess if yeah. you're on light land, you probably have to put it on sometime during flowering too. But well, in, in all honesty, we did do a study on, on that, more of a field scale study, and, and Dr. Kelly Turkington up in Lacombe has, was part of that study. And it's kind of a tough thing to say don't water at the most important time of the year. Mm -hmm. So the best strategy there is just to make sure that your soil profile is topped up right before the onset of flowering and then try to um, not water, say, during that week or 10, to 10 days when it's flowering. And, and any strategies that can minimize the, the time that uh, the wheat is flowering as well can help too. So tiller management and seeding rates and things like that. So right. I'm not sure how well that's, that practice is adopted, to be honest with you. Um, you know, we're still seeing lots of fusarium uh, popping up. But, of course, like you mentioned before, when we were driving over here, you get a couple of dry years and you don't send, tend to have um, that disease uh, level. So then, just, mm -hmm. you know, you quick, quickly forget those types of strategies when, when you can. And so I, I worry about when, when things get wet again, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no wet yeah. years are, you know, it's difficult. I mean, even th this year, you would think now in Saskatchewan, we've had two fairly dry years. The amount of residue harboring the, the pathogen mm -hmm. should be reduced. Yep. But, you know, we know we have it. It's not going away, but it's just kind of judging. It's very difficult to make a decision. Should I spray or should I not? It's never yes, no. It's kind no. of more risk, less risk conditions. Yeah. So we've had a couple of dry years. Maybe we have a little less inoculum. Uh, with this year, we started off really dry. The canopy is not nice and thick as we might like. You right. know, like I think our yield potential has been compromised just due to being so dry. Right. We didn't really get rain till the 20th of June. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, you, those are less risk conditions. On the other hand, if we get high humidity and uh, moisture and nice warm temperatures, now that the crop's coming into flower, it might be just those are high risk conditions. So, time, yeah. yeah, I mean, a lot of this comes down to growers' experience. Yep and the history of managing the disease, uh, the varieties they're growing, whether they're prepared to spray or not, and uh, those kind of strategies to deal with it. So, so what's your opinion on, on this idea of, of predicting uh, risk management? So, so there's di various different um, programs out there. I know even in Alberta now, they're, they're using the ACES weather network, the Alberta Ag Agriculture Weather Network, to try to help 
put together a sort of a little bit of a gauge as to the risk, but you know, then maybe combining that with spore trapping and things like that. Do we really have any good warning systems or, or are they coming? I think all of these are pieces of the puzzle or, or tools that help, but yeah. you know, you have to know your own farm, your own crop. And so it's pretty hard for an outsider to come and look at your field and say, yes, you should or shouldn't uh, spray or change variety or change your rotation. It's, mm-hmm. it's, uh, it's up to the grower to really use that information. So, you know, the, in Saskatchewan, we have uh, the website uh, that the uh, uh, Wheat Development Commission uh, posts mm-hmm. uh, on conditions uh, throughout the flowering period to give growers an idea. Is it higher risk or is it lower risk, you know, based on moisture? Yeah. Um, but it still depends. If you're a Durham grower, then you're going to be at much higher risk right. than uh, a hard red spring grower likely, although the Durham growers tend to be in the southeast of our province, which is the driest area. So generally the driest area, not yeah. always, right? So it's, I think those are tools, but no, I don't think there's any one place you can go and get a definitive yes or no answer. Yeah, it's, so it's, it's, really it's a tricky one. It's a tricky so one. So you got a tough job. Yeah. Well, I try not to give <laughs> uh, yes or no answers because, yeah. you know, it, you You're know, like the weatherman. Yeah, yeah, a bit like the weatherman. A lot of people hate the weatherman right now. <laughs> well, yeah. a bit like an economist, <laughs> I guess. You're always trying to predict what's yeah. going to happen, but yeah. there's always exceptions. There's yeah. always individual cases where, you know, growers are more or less familiar with the disease and how they've managed it in yeah. the past. Well, you mentioned economists. Actually, uh, that's that's supposed to be the big driver, right? So what I've always found interesting is is we're dealing with probabilities and risk, and, and it's almost like an insurance type thing. So I, I find that at least the fungicide application, the decision to spray or not, you know, kind of comes down to that insurance um, policy. So are you protecting yield or not? And, and I think that that ends up being a pretty nice way to sell fungicides for sure. Do you, do you think that, that growers have the tools to make those decisions the best, to the best of their ability rather than simply, oh, this is my insurance policy? Well, I mean, that's what we'd like to see, I think, as scientists, because, you know, just... <clears throat> prophylactic spraying uh, as insurance, it's not a good long-term strategy because we don't have a lot of fungicides, to be honest, right? We, so especially for Xerium. Well, we, yeah. we're depending uh, on the uh, triazoles. And uh, so one group of fungicides, if we're spraying them routinely without thinking about it, our pathogen could easily develop resistance. And, uh, you know, that's yeah. happened in many crops, uh, many diseases, especially in Europe where fungicides are used a lot more, they just become ineffective after some time. So, so. There, there's disease resist or resistance to fungicides in Europe, and we don't have a lot of different modes of action of fungicides here. No, like we don't use the strobilurins for fusarium for a number of reasons, I guess, but uh, so we're very dependent on one yeah. group of fungicides. So they've been pretty effective. They're not the highest risk that uh, pathogens will develop resistance to them, mm-hmm. but it's still been shown it does happen yeah. you know, in different diseases. So, yeah, it's much better if we can use that. If it's a hot, dry year, probably no sense putting a fungicide on if you feel there's no risk. Yeah. Where the difficulty is, you know, we've been dry, but now we're not. At least a lot of part of the prairies have yeah, had so pretty good rain. timing matters a lot. So timing matters. Yeah. So now it becomes a little more difficult. So that's when you look at those kind of factors. If you've got these weather networks, you can use that as one you know, one, one piece, uh, of, piece of the information, yeah. which type of weed are you growing, which variety are you growing, what's the resistance level of that mm-hmm. variety, what's your past history, are you growing wheat on wheat, hopefully not, yeah. uh, but even a wheat canola rotation, it's higher risk than say a four-year a four year rotation, a four different crop rotation. So right? is this all intuitive risk management or is there a way to, you know, build a scorecard? I mean, we do have uh, des- decision support systems. You're, you're familiar with the sclerotinia checklist, right? So yeah. there, people are developing and have developed some of these things, but still a lot of it comes down to your farm. It's sort of and qualitative, um, specific information. Yeah, yeah. Well, your experience and, and how you're managing, mm-hmm. uh, you know, w- the way you're growing wheat. So, yeah, it, it's really hard to just go through a checklist and come out with a perfect answer. Yeah. It's, uh, there's a lot of variables that you have to consider as a grower. So just for the viewer and listeners, um, you mentioned strobulins and uh, triazoles. What are, what are they? Are they they're active ingredients in certain fungicides? Well, they're yeah. families or classes of fungicides. Yeah. So uh, the strobilurins are very effective fungicides, and we use a lot of them in many crops, uh, but not for fusarium head blight. I think only Twinline is one that has a bit of strobilurin in it, but mm-hmm. it also has the triazole. Yep. Tri- uh, strobilurins have been very effective. Headline is one you would know probably, right? Sure. That's a strobilurin. Yep. 
But it's been shown that a lot of pathogens can develop resistance quite rapidly with repeated use of, that, of yeah. those fungicides uh, for the same disease. So if you're growing a short rotation, wheat canola, say, and you're spraying uh, either crop uh, quite frequently mm -hmm. each year with a strobilurin, uh, you may start to see resistance develop. Certainly mm -hmm. for the chickpea growers for Ascochyta, that's happened. Most of our, our Ascochyta uh, pathogen is resistant to uh, strobilurins. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. I actually didn't know that. Yeah. So you're kind of wasting your money spraying if it's not, uh, you know, if it's not yeah. working anymore. So with the triazoles, mm -hmm. the risk of resistance is much lower. And okay. so I don't know that we have a big problem or any problem yet really, mm -hmm. but the same exists that with repeated use, multiple applications per season. And then if you're growing, you know, two year rotation, you're maybe using those products quite frequently, yeah. maybe on both crops even. So, the so how do you know? Are, I mean, half of the time I find we don't know that the fungicides are working to begin with. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't tend to leave check strips because then you're going to have this chunk of disease piece of, of land. Um, you know, on the on the weed side of things, it's it's hard enough to discover resistance. But it seems to me like, you know, tracking fungicide resistance is, is going to be a challenge. And is that something maybe we need to do a better job of as far as monitoring and scouting? Yeah, I mean, some of us are doing it in the lab. So, yeah. you know, we go out and we collect isolates from growers' fields of the pathogen. We bring them back to the lab and we put them on media that's been amended with different concentrations of fungicide. Yeah. And we, so we get an idea of, okay, what's normal? How much, uh, what, is, what concentration of that fungicide do you have to inhibit the growth, say 50% compared to the untreated? So you have mm -hmm. no fungicide in some Petri plates, right? Okay. Uh, so you get an idea of what's normal. So then when growers call, phone in and, or call you or say, come out to my field, I, your fungicide didn't work or the fungicide didn't work. Yeah. Then you can maybe test it, take the isolate and say, okay, compare it to what we've done in the lab. Is it the same or is it really much more tolerant of the fungicide? Okay. So, so you would take a, a diseased piece of tissue from the field that didn't work and, and send it and literally have a lab test done. So it's Well, not I don't know how many of the private labs are doing testing right. per se. I mean, we're doing it for research purposes. Mm -hmm. So we've done some work in flax for PASMO, Septoria. Okay. Uh, we've done some work on tan spot with uh, Steven Strelkov at U of A. Mm -hmm. um, so we're kind of dabbling because we do think this could become an issue. Yeah, yeah. Certainly in, the, in Europe where fungicides are much more common for quite a few more decades than yeah. here. You know, and, uh, and Asia too, other parts of the world, definitely yeah. fungicide resistance is a concern. So this will put it, by doing this kind of work with students, uh, generally grad students have been doing it, um, we get an idea of what's the normal variation because, you know, if you collect 100 isolates or, path or uh, samples of a pathogen, mm -hmm. they won't all be the same. There'll be variation depending on the genetics. But when we get growers phoning in and saying, look, this fungicide did not work at all, then we can c compare it and say, well, it's no different than what we have here, so yeah. then maybe it's an application problem. Was it put on at the right time? Yeah. Um, was, was there, there something else in the tank? Was there, um, didn't spray and a uh, highly uh, concentration wasn't correct? Right. Or is it really resistant? The fungicide mm. is not working anymore. So if we yeah. take it back to the lab, put it on our Petri plates that amended with fungicide, and yep, it's, it's tolerant. It, it grows like wildfire on that plate, even yeah. with fungicide, then we know we have a problem. So as if the growers don't have enough to worry about, there, there's that, that management piece as, as well. And, and I know certainly fungicides, they, they do work quite well sometimes and they can really pay for themselves. But I, I also worry too that we're, we're at times overusing them or not using them as responsibly as Yeah, well, I think we we've be. learned yeah. our lesson a bit with, yeah. with herbicides, right? I well, mean, man, the kosher you, issue. We never thought we were going to have Roundup Ready, or it's not Roundup Ready, sorry, glyphosate tolerant anything. Yeah. You know, that, that's what we, I even knew that, and I'm younger than I look. But <laughs> um, yeah, so that's, that's interesting. So let's talk a little bit about um, the project that we're working in, in partnership with. So, so you've got a, a, a new project that started last year that was through the cluster, one of the clusters, the agronomy cluster. Uh, right? Yeah, we're yep. to, well, part of the CAP program that you had mentioned yep. the podcast series is uh, also uh, supported with. And that's the federal CAP. Yeah, yeah, the federal program. So it's, there's many different uh, commodity organizations that have contributed, mm -hmm. uh, but it's it, through Western Grain Research Foundation is our uh, main contact. Uh, Pat Flayton, if you know mm -hmm. Pat, is kind of the coordinator. So uh, she's the one I talked to about this project. So the idea, it's a very simple applied project really to look at sequencing. So what are higher risk sequences versus lower risk sequences uh, in terms of fusarium head blight? So Can we you explain what, 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 what you mean by sequences? Just really the crops that we're growing. 
right? Mm-hmm. So uh, you've got a lot of them here. You've got 10 crops in your s- crop sequence trial. So right. we've grown 10 strips of 10 different crops in the field last year. And then this year we seeded them perpendicular. So now we have 10 crops on each stubble yep. from last year, right? So we have 100 treatments. Mm-hmm. Next year we're going to seed that to Durham, in your case. Yep. And we're going to come back and we're going to look for fusarium. Right. And uh, we hope to show that, you know, some of these sequences should have less fusarium than other sequences. So, for instance, if you're growing corn on corn and then planting wheat on that, that's probably, at least our hypothesis mm-hmm. is, that's probably the worst thing you can do because corn is known to harbor fusarium very well. Yep. Fusarium uh, really likes corn, does well on it. So, you know, we want to show farmers, especially in Saskatchewan where corn is relatively new, mm-hmm. Manitoba, I think, has 400,000 acres, but, uh, uh, you know, some of the companies have suggested they want to see uh, or they have material that will be very uh, uh, possible to grow a lot more corn in Western yeah. Canada. Yeah, we've got two of those uh, breeding locations here in, in Lethbridge, actually. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, wheat growers, Durham growers in particular, but any wheat grower is probably going to have to think that if they're going to get into corn, Okay, what are the ramifications for growing wheat without fusarium? Mm-hmm. Whereas if you're growing other crops that are either uh, not susceptible to fusarium or it's a minor issue, then probably you should have less, you know, much less problem. Yeah. So, that, so it's a really simple concept, but, you know, it's, these studies are quite big, large yeah. in terms of area and amount of technical stuff you need. So there hasn't been that many studies uh, done like this. Uh, crop rotation studies are right. expensive and long term. So right. we're quite grateful that the CAP program uh, considered funding yeah. this. I, ever since I got into the agronomy research world, I've always been interested in cropping systems and rotational studies, but there's a there's a huge stigma against funding them for some reason. And I think maybe because they're they're difficult and I've heard some people say, oh, I can punch holes through that data. And, <laughs> and then again, it's so unique to to different environments. But then on the flip side, I always hear from farmers, I mean, yeah, well, what should I grow after this crop? So I think there's a strong demand for better information. But so, so why, why has it been such a challenge to get these types of projects funded? I mean, I think part of it is just the, the, the long-term nature of yep. an actual crop rotation study. So what we're doing is crop sequencing, which in my mind is really a short version like of a, mini, a longer mini study. Rotation kind of thing. You know, like a few number of years ago in the late 90s, the canola growers came to us and said, well, we've got Roundup and Liberty Link resistant varieties, so we don't need to do a four-year rotation for weeds anymore. We've got black leg resistance. Why aren't we growing canola every two years? You know? mm. And so we, we put a study together to, to do that, to start, look at those issues. And what we find is, well, you, you can, and growers have gotten away with it for 20 years. But there's more and more inputs required. There's more and more spraying. There's yeah. more and more risk involved. Canola's become quite an expensive crop to grow. Mm-hmm. All right. And uh, so it's not saying you can't do it, but be prepared. You're going to spend more money doing it. Right. Whereas if you can lengthen your rotation out, so a lot of these pathogens degrade over time. Once the residue of the crop is gone, a lot yeah. of times the pathogen is gone. So black leg's a key issue. Once the residue, those little woody bits, uh, the bottom of the plant yeah. are gone, pretty much your pathogen And I've heard gone. you need sort of three years out for black leg or so? Or I would say I still four. like a four-year rotation. Yeah. I mean, you can find those woody bits easily after three years. Yeah. Maybe so what the, if, sorry, go ahead. Uh, maybe the majority of the spores are released, but you still have some problem there. Yeah. And, uh, so if you get a, a really disease-conducive year, uh, three years, I would say, is a minimum. Mm-hmm. You know. What's the time frame for fusarium then? Fusarium being that we don't have the woody bits... Uh, probably a little less. The problem is we have, you know, 24, 25 million acres of wheat across the prairies every year. So yeah. we've got a lot of residue out there just from the sheer amount of acres we're growing. Yeah. Similar to canola, I guess. We have 20 million acres of canola in most yeah. years or even more. So you do have a lot of residue out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, but getting back to the sequence study, I, I think the long-term nature, to do a proper crop uh, rotation study, you probably want, if you're doing four-year rotations, mm-hmm. you probably want at least two or three of them well, that's eight to 12 years. Funding doesn't tend to work that way in right. Western Canada. I mean, we get yeah. three years worth of funding, five if you're lucky. Yeah. So I think that's one of the reasons it's hard to continue these studies over the long term yeah. and, and give farmers an answer that, uh, well, every year we might know what's happening, but over 10 years, yeah. we don't really know because we haven't studied this. There's, there's not that many rotation studies that long. Yeah, that's true. I, I also find the more that I embark in, in various studies, I find that there, there is no rules of thumb 
pretty much in anything. There, there's so much variation. What you see one year, you might not see the next year. So mm-hmm. I think um, we try to do our best to come up with with generalities, but there's a lot of it depends, isn't there? Oh, there certainly is. I yeah. mean, it, you know, it depends on the varieties you're growing. Some yeah. of them are very resistant to certain diseases, and uh, unfortunately, fusarium is not one of them. You know, like mm-hmm. I said, in the hard red springs, we're getting there. Yeah, We're much better than we were 10, 20 years ago, but there's nothing we would say is totally resistant. If the, if the, yeah. ep- ep- <coughs> sorry, if the epidemic is severe enough because the weather conditions are, are there and you've got a lot of residue from past years, yeah. uh, it's probable that you're going to have some degree of fusarium. So most of the growers will know what fusarium is, and I think that that one of the reasons is that it, that there's an economic impact, especially to the fusarium gram, graminarium. But uh, we didn't really discuss what that disease is, and and a little bit about it itself and how it impacts growers, just to to help out understand the the issue. Because um, I know in Alberta, actually, fusarium came around probably close to 20 years now. And corn was blamed for it back then too, um, when we started bringing in silage corn in southern Alberta for sure. And there was a fusarium task force and trying to do everything we could preventative to keep it from coming in the province. But unfortunately, it's here now, mm-hmm. and it's more so in southern Alberta. And then the the far you know at this point in time, we're still not allowed to actually um, get seed that has fusarium on it. It's it's a zero tolerance uh, rule here in Alberta. So that's causing a bit of a fight between, you know, the folks in Southern Alberta. I mean, low levels of fusarium might be completely acceptable. Um, so seed growers, you know, should really should be able to sell that seed as long as there's a seed treatment and so on. But then the growers in the North are still, you know, trying to protect their areas, I suppose, from, from getting it there. And it's caused a bit of a, a battle, but I know uh, graminarium in particular, it doesn't take a lot of, uh, of infection to really cause an economic um, hit from the pocketbook for for farmers. So maybe talk about that a little bit. Yeah, well, the disease Fusarium is the genus, and there's many species, right? So um, it's very common genus. Um, Many root diseases are caused by different Fusarium species. Uh, Some of them similar or the same that cause uh, Fusarium head bite. Mm -hmm. But really it's when Fusarium griminiarum, uh, we also have Calmorum, Avanasium, Mm -hmm. Poe, a few others, but generally, Griminiarum, my friend Kelly des- described it as the pit bull of Fusarium. Mm-hmm. That's the worst one. And when those spores get up onto the head at this time of year, when it's moist and get into the flowers, that causes problems. So the, the, main, the first problem you see is the head itself will look bleached about three weeks from now, probably mm-hmm. you know, a little earlier here. But for us uh, in Saskatoon, it's usually around, say, the second week of August, third week of August. We see that you know, the, the spikes do not look... Uh, nice right. and uniform. Yeah. They're, they're bleached, and sometimes if it's severe, you can actually see the pink, mm-hmm. orange color of the fusarium sporulating right on the head. So the first thing you see when you thrust your samples out is tombstone kernels. Uh, they can be uh, sometimes devastating. That you know, the grain buyers just won't buy it because yeah. it's uh, it's so and those damaged. Are shriveled up kernels. Is that right? Shriveled up kernels for the most part. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you can actually see sporulation on the kernels again. Um, and the, the worst part, I'd say, or certainly equally severe as the yield loss, is also the toxin content. Mm-hmm. So Griminiarum <coughs> and a couple other species, but especially Griminiarum, produce toxins. Okay. And so, you know, you can't feed that to animals at certain levels. Like I think for uh, swine, it's like one part per million. It has to be below that. Uh, I believe cattle will tolerate quite a bit more, but still there's a limit. Um, selling into the human food market you know, for Durham, it's, there's very low tolerances for this stuff. So right. it either has to be blended off or some way to separate it out. And um, the hard part is there's not a strong relationship between what you see in the damaged kernels and the toxin. Right. So sometimes you'll see, oh, the sample looks pretty good. I don't think I have a problem. And then you get it tested and it's got 10 parts per million fus- uh, toxin maybe. Yeah. So, and vice versa. Sometimes it can look not so good but there's not much toxin in it. And do they test every load for, for the toxins? I don't know. You know, I don't know what the, the folks that are feeding animals, 
I think more and more they are. I mm-hmm. know certainly the breeding programs now are looking more and more at the toxins. You know, yeah. uh, five years ago or more, it was really just the the amount of damage kernels, just the visual rating. Visual before, rating. Yeah. But you know, it's because the correlation is so poor between the amount of toxin and the visual rating. Mm-hmm. Uh, more and more of the breeders are selecting. So they're running the tests on the samples. They see how much toxin is there yep. and selecting their breeding material based on uh, you know low toxin content. And I would imagine that would, would also affect any export markets as well, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. And I think that's one of the issues. The Europeans really want to lower uh, the amount of toxins in, in grains mm-hmm. and uh, not just fusarium, but other uh, aspergillus, other uh, fungi mm-hmm. that co- that create toxins in grain. So yeah. I think it's a it's from what I've heard it's it's an issue for the industry that yeah. uh, we really need to somehow get a handle on on the toxin content and try and keep it as low as possible. Sure, and that's that the Dawn toxin is is usually the one we're talking about with fusarium. Or is fusarium produces that? many different toxins. Dawn yeah. is certainly the most common and uh, the mo- the one you read about and hear about the most. But yeah. there are other toxins, and some of them I, I understand are even more toxic. Than than Dawn, no but kidding, uh, they eh? tend to be at lower levels and, and yeah. uh, not as, you know, Dawn is probably in in most samples, you're going to find some level of Dawn, but mm-hmm. there are the other toxins too. Yeah. So it's a, it's a big issue. I know that uh, small amounts of the graminarium can downgrade uh, a sample really quickly and that, that really significantly impacts the revenue for farmers, but it also leaves you with a product that you have a hard time getting rid of. So mm-hmm. that's why it's been such a big uh, big issue. I, is it something we can live with? Like we're, we've been living with it, and I think uh, Saskatchewan and Manitoba have been living with it, and they're still growing wheat. So it just makes it more important to, to use the management strategies that you've been sort of learning are the best approaches kind of thing? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I can see people not growing wheat to mm-hmm. some degree, but, you know, in Manitoba, they've had some mm-hmm. advantages. So soybeans have really taken off in Manitoba. I think okay. there are like 2 million acres of soybeans now. Yep. When I was a kid growing up in Manitoba, they used to try and try it more than to grow soybeans, but it never really took off. Yeah. But, you yeah. know, in the last 10 years, soybeans have been an option for many people I know in Manitoba. Mm-hmm. Corn is now becoming more of an option, but as we discussed with our crop sequence trial, we're wondering how is that going to fit into growing wheat, right, with the disease. So, But, you know, in Saskatchewan, we're a little more limited yet. Um, There is interest in soybeans. There are some soybean growers, but I can't see the whole province (laughs) adopting soybeans anytime soon. You can't just replace a crop like wheat, and nor would you want to. No, well, I mean, a lot of the crops, they still depend on heat and frost-free days. And so, uh, you know, our falls seem to be getting longer. I'm not sure our springs are any better. They seem to be cooler almost. Yeah. Um, but, you know, if we can diversify the crop rotation, that will help. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we've done, a, Saskatchewan's done a pretty good job with pulse crops. And same in Alberta here, you guys are growing a lot more pulse crops than you would sure. have 10, 20 years ago, right? Yep. So that helps a lot. So that's one of the key strategies. Use the best varieties you can. The breeders are working hard to try and improve those varieties. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, the Durham breeders, I'm sure it's a high priority for them, but yep. they've got a ways to go. It takes time. Yeah. Yeah. And then work on our fungicide application and try and develop these decision support systems, like you say, using weather networks to figure out the weather, using modeling perhaps. Um, you know, like some of the models suggest that temperature be every hour of the day between 15 and 30, the more hours per day and per week that it's between that, uh, temp- mm-hmm. it's in that temperature range and uh, relative humidity. So if your relative humidity is high, the more hours per week or per day or per week or per yep. plowing period that it's say 90%, those are kind of risk, those are risk factors. So you add those up and basically the more uh, hours of the flowering period that fall into those uh, category, mm-hmm. uh, the, the increased risk. So uh, there's a Dawn cast model that uh, Southern Ontario developed. There's a model from the States uh, developed by a guy named DeWolf. Mm-hmm. And so some of these are being used, uh, you know, to try and help growers get a handle on whether it's high risk, whether it's low risk, whether they should spray, whether they should maybe, do, you know, diversify their rotation more. All right. Yeah. Well, it's definitely not an easy one to play with. And we certainly appreciate having researchers like yourself that are continuing to, to help at least provide some science to, to to deal with the issues and best of wishes on the, the sequencing project and, and your entire program. And we look forward to having you on the, on the show again sometime soon. Okay, thanks, Kenna. Thanks for the invitation to talk at your field day tomorrow about yeah. our crop sequence study. That's actually a really good segue. Um, you know, keep uh, keep in mind that our, uh, our, our program tomorrow will actually be filmed as well and, and available to our subscribers for both our smart agronomy package and our and our smart agronomist package. So 
that uh, that's that's the benefit of, of signing into to those types of things. And we appreciate you being there and, and look forward to a good day. Thanks a lot. Take care.